So, Boker Tov, Shalom, good morning, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Yes, I have been with MathWorks for about 16 years, and prior to MathWorks, um, many years ago, I spent my time working as a data scientist doing uh, image processing, artificial intelligence, computer vision. So it's actually great to see technologies that I've personally worked on really come to be mainstream and, and applications that many, many of you are working on today. So it's very gratifying. The title of this talk is How to Build an Autonomous Anything. I really have three main points I want to communicate. Number one, I'm going to give you a, a basic framework to think about the technologies that span across a complex autonomous system. With that framework, the second goal is to give you a few questions to be thinking about as you are building your autonomous systems. And of course, third, throughout the talk, I'll highlight at a very high level investments that MathWorks continues to make in MATLAB, Simulink, and extensions to MATLAB and Simulink to make your jobs easier. Now, when you think about autonomous systems, what are the types of systems that you think about? What comes to mind when you think about autonomy? Certainly, I'm sure most people immediately think about self-driving cars. They are everywhere. They're almost literally every week, if not every day, there's some type of an announcement about technology advancements in the field of autonomous driving. So very, very visible, very, very important technology we'll hear a lot about today. Also, robotics, humanoid robots, like Asimo here from Honda. Robotics, in fact, is another rapidly growing area in the development of autonomous systems. And of course, drones, but not just drones for government and, and defense applications. We're starting to see real examples of drones being piloted and tested for commercial applications. And so we're starting to see more testing of drones for retail, delivery of retail packages. So most of you are familiar with mobility and robotics, but what we get to see at MathWorks when we see applications of MATLAB and Simulink is we're starting to see autonomous technology being used in many different industries and many different applications. We are seeing it in harvesting. This is a, this is a uh, photograph of an automatic harvester that can pull and sort corn at about 300 tons per hour. I did a little bit of uh, mathematics and figured out that roughly in one hour, this room would be filled about three feet high with corn with this autonomous system op in operation. And we'll talk about this. Here is an autonomous oil and gas pump rig that is uh, becoming smarter in terms of our ability to apply maintenance to it. We'll talk about that. And ironically, medical devices. Uh, we are seeing more autonomy being brought to more medical devices, such as, in this case, a diabetes monitoring system. And we'll give you an example of how this is being brought to bear with MATLAB and Simulink for autonomous technology. So, those are some of the applications we will talk about this morning, and I will use those to highlight, again, the basic framework for approaching autonomous systems and giving you some questions to think about. So let's get uh, set with some definitions. When I talk about autonomous technology, what am I talking about? Well, we'll start with the word autonomous, which basically means having the ability to act independently. When you think about that in the application of technology and systems, we're talking about a system that can act independent, independently of direct human control. Now, but if you really think about it, that sounds very close to what you might call automation. And there's a difference between automation and truly autonomous technology. Automation, a robot can place a door on a car frame in a car factory the same time, every time, perfectly. But a auto truly autonomous robot can navigate the world around it and make decisions based upon what it comes into contact with while it navigates that world. So the key difference between automation and autonomous technology is that these systems can operate under unrehearsed conditions. They've learned and therefore can take control even in situations they've never faced before. That's where everybody's trying to go. So to set up my framework, I will go back to 
the technology we're all very uh, seeing all over the place, which is the autonomous car, self-driving car. I'll use this to lay out the framework of a system. And the first set of capabilities that is needed is the ability to sense the world around the system. In the case of a car, you will, he you will hear this morning throughout the day, there are multiple sensors on these cars, GPS for location, radar for relative velocity, cameras for scene collection, LIDAR for 3D, and so forth. And really, the real challenge is infusing all of those different sensor signals together in something called sensor fusion, which is then used for further processing. And that further processing involves perception, perceiving the world around you, fusing all of the inputs from those sensors to figure out where the lanes are, and to detect lane markings, to read signposts, to identify pedestrians, even to figure out which pedestrians might be paying attention to the car and which pedestrians might be just staring down at their phone and not paying attention. And it is the application of techniques like machine learning and deep learning in computer vision that are being used to build these smart, perceptive computer systems. Now you move into decision and planning. You've got all of this information, you've understood what's around you, now you have to figure out how to make the right decision. In the case of a car, if there's an obstacle in front of you, do you slow down? Do you swerve? Do you do both? If you change lanes, do you go to the left or to the right? All of these decisions have to be made instantly using all of the information and all of the learning built up over time through these systems. And we are seeing companies at a higher level apply techniques like optimization for things like path planning. Once you've decided what you want to do, then you have to move into action. Here is a video of a self-driving prototype from Mercedes that is operating by itself, it is slowing up, it is speeding down, it is maintaining safe distance, it is changing lanes. Here is where you connect the intelligence built through your algorithms to the controls that are controlling the car. And quite frankly, one of the benefits, one of the differentiators of working in MATLAB and Simulink is that you can build your applications and your algorithms in MATLAB and seamlessly connect them through your control system to your actuators to control the embedded system. It all just works with a framework based on MATLAB and Simulink. So sensing, perception, decision and planning and action, those are the four parts of the framework. And when I talk through the applications, I will highlight various uses of technology throughout that framework. Now the self-driving car, there's a, there's a continuum here. There's a degree of autonomy. The self-driving car is all the way to the right on this, sort of level five, you'll hear about that today as well. Level five uh, uh, autonomy. And this is where the computer is basically doing everything. But there are very interesting and very important applications where there's a blend between what the, comu what the computer does and what the human does. And what you have to figure out is where is the best place, the optimal place for your application on this continuum from some human interaction all the way to the computer doing everything. And some of the examples I will show you are, are uh, in various places along this axis, the x-axis here. Now, we've talked about embedded systems, we've talked about cars and, and drones, but the first example I'm going to show you might be a little surprising. It's, the, it's actually art history. So here are two paintings. Do you recognize the influence of one painting on the other? Can you see some, some relationship between the two? One was painted by Bazille in 1870, and the second on the right by Rockwell in 1950 in the United States. Well, if you look more closely, you'll see each of these paintings has a chair and a group of people and a stove in the same relative position. You'll also notice each painting has a large rectangular window in a similar location. And finally, the composition of each is very similar in terms of the horizontal, the vertical, and the diagonal layouts. Well, it was a computer that made these connections, not a human. Human art historians, when they try and understand influences and relationships, they will look at where artists studied, where they lived, who they worked with, where they traveled, but they don't have the ability to do high-end computer vision and image processing to do feature extraction and find connections such as those found here. So researchers at Rutgers University in the United States figured they would try using a computer to enhance the human art historian's ability to make these connections. And here's how they did this. They used computer vision and perception. 
they applied computer vision and they did unsupervised learning to allow the computer to detect low-level features like edges and corners. And then they used supervised learning to allow the computer to detect objects like the chair, the people, the stove, and so forth. And then they fed both the, the, uh, the low-level and the high-level features into support vector machines. And they had different support vector machines, one for style, one for genre, and one for artist. And through processing thousands and thousands and thousands of paintings and being able to apply computer perception, they were able to make the connections I showed in the previous slide. So that's a case where the computer is being used to enhance the capability of the human and applying some level of autonomy to a rather surprising application. So you want to think about where you want to apply perception, and there are many benefits to applying perception and computer vision to your applications. First of all, clearly you can analyze a lot more data. You also remove some of the bias that might be introduced by a human doing the analysis in the first place. Using a computer gives you the ability to improve your measurement quality, and of course it saves you time and improves your system performance. So it's not just art history, it's many applications. We have examples of a company doing loudspeaker quality, training a computer to recognize subjectively poor loudspeaker quality in order to improve their speaker production, speaker design. And ASML, the world's largest semiconductor manufacturing equipment company, is using computer vision to enhance their calibration process, and they are seeing a 75% reduction in their calibration time through a computer vision-based approach. One of the tracks today is image processing and deep learning, and there was a talk to, to learn, for you to learn about what is new in image processing and computer vision with MATLAB. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to attend that track. Okay, let us move on to sort of the more traditional engineering applications, starting with this Baker Hughes oil and pump rig, oil and gas pump rig. So this is one pump rig. This machine costs about a million dollars. It has one major pump on it. That pump costs about $100,000. And that pump consists of a series of valves. And replacing any single valve, a valve costs about $200. So their objective here is to figure out what is the optimal maintenance strategy in order to keep this pump rig operating at full capacity in a 24 by 7 environment. Now, the simple approach to that is sort of just do a regular maintenance interval. But that really doesn't make a lot of sense and doesn't really work. Let me talk about why. Here is an aerial photograph of a typical well. And what you see in the right is these pump rigs lined up side by side and end on end. First of all, they want to operate these in 24-7. The source of the, uh, the, the oil or the gas might be different from well to well. So they could be operating at different temperatures, different viscosities, different pressures, and so forth. So all of this variability means that the, the actual life they're getting from these valves can be anywhere from about half the expected life to about twice the expected life. And because they want to run these systems 24-7, they can't just shut that something down when a valve fails or a pump fails. So what they, end, they tend to do is they have extra pump rigs on location at the well site. Now remember, each of those pump rigs costs about a million dollars. So there has to be a smarter way to figure out what the optimal maintenance strategy is. So what they did was they took the sensing approach. They added about 25 sensors to a rig, measuring things like pressure, vibration, timing, temperature, and so forth. And they collected a lot of data and tried to figure out how can I predict a failure autonomously before it happens. So the first thing they did, and, the, and these rigs are generating about, in a six month period, one rig generates about 100 gigabytes of data. So it's a lot of data. So the first thing they did was they did a correlation analysis and they figured out through correlation that out of the 25, they really only needed to use three sensors, pressure, vibration, and timing. And they related the output of those three sensors to their data they collected over time on when failures occurred. And they used statistical analysis and frequency domain analysis to convert the sensor signals and input those into self-organizing maps using neural network toolbox. And from this, they got three 
basic signatures, a signature of a pump operating normally, a pump that might need to be monitored much more closely, and one that was in need of maintenance right away. And here's another example where this autonomy is now married with the human knowledge. So the human operator knows other things like what the already scheduled maintenance system might be for that particular well site, when the system might be prepared to be shut down. And so they can bring that type of knowledge along with the autonomous predictive power of this, of this machine learning approach to figure out how to produce an optimal maintenance strategy. And it was through these strategies that Baker Hughes is saving about $10 million a year in maintenance costs. Now, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what they did. They used a very classic machine learning approach where the human is in the loop. First, the human is involved in doing correlation analysis, and then the human is doing the feature extraction, and they're feeding that into the neural network. And there are a lot of advantages to this, okay? They were able to get a lot of data reduction, and they figured out they only needed three sensors. But you still have a human doing some of this feature extraction. Maybe that wasn't giving them the optimal predictive capability. So an alternative approach would have been to try deep learning. Here you would take the 25 sensors, you would feed the raw data from the 25 sensors, you would treat it as an image, a very long 25 by n image, and feed that into a deep network and let the deep network do the feature extraction and classification. So the advantages of this approach, you take the human out of the loop, you might increase or improve your predictive power, but you're going to need a lot more data in order to get that predictive power. So these are the types of questions you need to be thinking about in your application. When is a machine learning approach going to work best for you? When is a deep learning approach? And they each have their strengths and their weaknesses. I think one of the beautiful things about working in MATLAB is you don't have to worry about your tooling. You can think about what makes sense for your workflow and your system, knowing that with MATLAB, the tools are just going to work in either case. And we continue to invest heavily in machine learning and deep learning technology. A lot of the other frameworks out there are really oriented around computer science. We believe we can bring machine learning and deep learning features and capabilities to engineers and to scientists working directly in MATLAB, making it easier for you to apply these new techniques. Through apps, the Classification Learner app came out a year ago. The Regression Learner app came out this year with 17A. This is bringing these types of capabilities to engineers who may not be deeply studied in computer science. And we're bringing deep learning technologies to you as well, with the ability to import pre-trained networks, to apply convolutional neural networks, uh, to uh, train your models on uh, GPUs. All of these capabilities, we continue to deliver release after release to bring deep learning and machine learning techniques to you as engineers and scientists. So you'll hear more about this in the image processing and deep learning track with Roy's talk on deep learning, how to do this in MATLAB. So a question you have to be thinking about is, what are your predictors? What are your sources of input in order to give you the predictive power? Baker Hughes used a very data-driven approach with their 25 sensors. Organizations working in model-based design already have a system model of their system, and the knowledge is encapsulated in that system model. And so we see companies applying both data-driven and model-driven approaches to improve predictive power. One example is Saffron, who's using model-based design and MATLAB-based analytics for a predictive health monitoring system for their jet engines. Now let's talk about autonomy being brought to medical devices. This is an automatic diabetes monitoring system by Bigfoot Biomedical. And the goal here is to automatically maintain the proper glucose insulin levels in the patient in real time. It's basically a control system. You have the human or the patient. You have a continuous glucose monitor that is feeding the glucose level into the control algorithm, which is controlling the insulin pump, injecting insulin at the right level. That's a fairly basic control problem. Bigfoot figured they wanted to go one better because they knew that a person's glucose levels fluctuate, vary, based on different things like what the person eats, when they eat, how frequently they eat, what their activity levels are, and so forth. So they supplemented this with an app that a person has on their smartphone. 
and the person can now enter into the app what they ate, how much they ate, when they ate, what their activity levels are. And this information is incorporated into the control strategies to optimally deliver the right insulin levels over time. And the person can override what the autom automation is doing if they feel the need, but in a safe and a monitored way. The way they were able to build their control system, they did it all in Simulink. They designed the entire system in Simulink, but they also had to, this is a medical device, this thing has to work in all types of error conditions. You know, what if the glucose monitor falls out? What if the insulin pump battery fails? What if it runs out of insulin? So they use state flow to, to model and monitor all of the different error correcting routines, and they used polyspace to verify the correctness and the robustness of their generated code. So a very nice application of control design all the way through code generation and code certification with Simulink, state flow, and polyspace. But if you think about it, this is, it's, it's hard enough just to do this with one person, even with one patient, we talked about how their glucose level changes throughout the day. It actually changes, of course, over time. As they gain weight, as they lose weight, they become pregnant and so forth. But they don't want to provide this just for one patient. They want to do this for entire populations of people. Imagine the variability they have to build into this system, encompassing things like genetic variability, even people's behaviors. How, how accurately will people record what they ate and when they ate and so forth? There's no way they could gather all of the raw patient data that would be needed to design their control strategies. It's just not possible. So, like they used Simulink and control design for, virtual, for a virtual simulation, they designed a virtual clinic, a MATLAB-based simulation. And with this MATLAB-based simulation, they are able to monitor human physiology and glucose level behaviors in, all based in MATLAB and they've connected this MATLAB simulation to their app. They helped design their app with this simulation so that they can figure out if they're presenting the right information to the patient in an understandable and clear way. With this simulation, they can simulate one patient or thousands of patients, and they can vary the time scales from seconds to hours to weeks to months and so forth. Now, of course, they have to scale this up. So what they were able to do is take this MATLAB code and quickly scale it up to 256 nodes on Amazon Web Services, AWS, to be able to do simulation of about 50 million patients per day. So a pretty impressive application of taking a MATLAB uh, technology and scaling it up and getting high-performance computing without changing any of their underlying code. So another question you want to be thinking about is where are you going to get your data? So Bigfoot Biomedical is getting their data through simulation. The art historians from Rutgers are getting data from public repositories. Baker Hughes is getting data from the field. You're also um, certainly gathering data in your own labs. And with the onset of Internet of Things, more embedded smart sensors are generating data you can store in data aggregators like ThinkSpeak, which has MATLAB analytics directly supporting your ThinkSpeak data. Baker Hughes, I mentioned 100 gigabytes of data for one, for one pump rig. We mentioned uh, million, 50 million patients per day. We're, getting, uh, we're delivering more capability each release to allow you to handle big data with MATLAB, and there's a talk by Shiron in the data analytics talk giving you more insight into these technologies. For example, you'll learn about tall tables. They were introduced a couple of releases ago. Every release, we had more capability and more support. And now you can stream large signals directly through Simulink from a MAT file from your MATLAB. So you'll learn about these techniques in that talk. Let us move on to this autonomous harvester from Case New Holland and talk about how this works. Let me show you a video of this in action. So this is an autonomous system which is going along. You still have an operator in the truck but the system itself is doing the harvesting and the filling of the trailer. These trailers fill up quite quickly, so the system has to locate a new trailer, automatically adjust the spout. You want to get an optimal distribution of the spray into a single trailer. It has to work in all types of conditions. It has to work in daytime, in nighttime, in dust, in darkness. So a very sophisticated, very complicated application of autonomy. 
Now, there's no way they were going to be able to do field testing of this type of, of system. You know, the harvest periods are short. It's very expensive to run these systems. So they designed it all in the lab. They, uh, they experimented with a number of different uh, uh, imaging techniques and ultimately set, settled on a 3D image processing camera, which enabled them to do a 3D point cloud and figure out what their optimal filling strategies is. They were already experienced users of model-based design, so they incorporated this computer vision application into their model-based design flow. And here is a screenshot and, a, simula and a, a, a video of their simulation in action. So you have the, the boom from the filler in the left there, the little purple tetrahedron, I think you can see it under the boom, that's the camera. And then the top two screens are showing the trailer, and then the bottom right is showing you the output from the camera. And so you can kind of see this thing operating and modeling and simulating what the various filling strategies that they're trying are going to produce. And it was through this simulation they were, they were able to produce their optimal filling strategies. So they did all of this in simulation. Now they want to go test it in the field. Now they're ready. Once they've got a filling strategy, they can test it in the field. So they take the laptop and they bring it onto the harvester. They use instrument control toolbox to connect the laptop to the 3D camera on the harvester on the boom. They used vehicle network toolbox to connect up to the actuators to control the filler. And they've got a display unit and uh, they connected up the CAN through CAN to, for the uh, UI to be on the display unit. And then they generated embedded code with embedded coder so that they could take the filling, the, the control algorithms and move it onto the display unit, which allowed them for the operator to use the laptop strictly for monitoring. And it was very gratifying for them to see that the operator said that the system worked exactly the same running from the embedded platform as it did on the laptop. Now, I mentioned they're very experienced model-based design users. They had been using an auto SAR based architecture, so they, everything just fit right into their existing workflow. So that's an example of a pretty sophisticated embedded system, which leads to another one of the questions you need to be thinking about is, you know, you're not just building these systems to sit around on your laptop. You're ultimately going to deploy this in some system. Case New Holland was building a full-on embedded system. Bigfoot Biomedical, in a sense, was deploying their, their simulation up to the cloud. We see financial services organizations deploying MATLAB algorithms within their IT systems to, to build predictive trading strategies. We see industrial automation companies building MATLAB apps and deploying those MATLAB apps directly onto the desktop of an operator at the plant to optimize maintenance strategies on the plant. And those people don't have to be native MATLAB users. They can operate directly through the app. So again, with MATLAB and Simulink, you have a number of different ways to move your system into production and deployment. And it all just works, either through code generation or high-performance computing. We continue to invest in model-based design, more uh, capabilities for code generation, more efficient code generation with clone detection in 17A, HDL code generation performance, as well as more support for certification and verification workflows. And you will learn about these and other enhancements in Manuel's talk on faster and safer system development with model-based design in the Smart Systems track. Okay, let's bring it all together. This is uh, Agile Justin, is the name of this robot. And Agile Justin was made by DLR, which is the German aerospace company. So this is a completely autonomous system with all four aspects of our framework in play. For sensing and perception, Justin has stereo cameras. And what Justin does is he, he uh, looks at the stereo camera and calibrates based on patterns designed into his hands in order to start to build a point cloud of his surroundings. And this allows Agile Justin to do a number of different pretty sophisticated tasks, from starting with working with pipes, and, and there's the point cloud and being able to manipulate the pipes, to uh, something pretty remarkable here where it learns how to identify a person and a ball and be able to play catch with the person. And here's a, this is a, is coming up here with two balls is pretty impressive, right here. Pretty nice. 
So a system like this can only be done with model-based design. This is a 53, 53 degree of freedom robot. And so DLR applied all of the model-based te te model design technologies from simulation to code generation to hardware in the loop, ultimately proving out that their controls and their computer vision systems were working perfectly on the computer and then moving them onto Agile Justin uh, for, for operation in real life. All right, so I said I had three goals. The first was to give you a framework, sense, perceive, decide and plan, and act. Talked about five different applications of various parts of that framework. A few questions for you to be thinking about from where can you apply computer vision and computer perception in your autonomous system? What are the best sources of data? And how can you apply model-driven approach for predictive power? How do you get the right data? How do you process big data? When should you use simulation? And what's your deployment strategy? Are you going to a full embedded system? Are you deploying to a cloud, an IT system, high performance computing system, and so forth? These are the things you need to be thinking about. And what we continue to do is invest in MATLAB and Simulink technologies to just make your jobs easier, make it easy for you to answer and address all of these questions. You know, I've been to many of these expos over the years, and every single time I go, when I talk to people in the audience, they are amazed at all of the technology they see around them throughout the day, both what is presented, but also what they hear their colleagues working on. So I encourage you to take it all in. You are going to learn an amazing amount of technologies today you perhaps were not aware of. Think about what they mean to you. Think about what you can learn and what you can apply and think about how to build your autonomous anything. Toda, thank you very much. Enjoy the conference.